I'm gonna pull a nail on barrel-aged Harris Orchard, the latest batch of this. So I believe this is the third time we've taken our favorite apricot peach mead and, and put it into a barrel to see what happens. So Harris Orchard is a seasonal release that comes out and the barrel-aged version, well, it comes out when the barrel says it's ready. This barrel is kind of cool because it started off its life as a brand new American oak barrel from Missouri with medium plus toasting as the toasting level. And the more toast that happens, the more heat you apply to the inside of the staves, you're gonna get different characteristics. And so just sort of like as you think it would, as you cook wood, you're gonna get smoke and roast and whatnot as you cook things more. If you, the lighter that you toast something, you're gonna have a more assertive oak character. And so with a medium plus barrel, I'm gonna to expect to see a certain amount of vanilla and a certain amount of, I don't, we might hit that roasty chocolate thing maybe. I'm kind of stoked to see. But we, we actually aged blackberry white, one of our like most famous, really big decadent dessert sweetmeads in this barrel. And so that's in the wood. It's inside the staves. It's probably, if we took this barrel apart, you could see a profile and it would be about a quarter of an inch inside this inch of oak right here. And, and after we pulled out blackberry white and we bottled that, we put uh, a Merlot piment. And so piment is wine, grapes, and honey. We use Merlot in that case. That became one of our contingency bottles that came out um, late last year. So we've got wine grapes that have been in here, blackberries, vanilla, white chocolate, and it's gonna be really interesting to see how that works with an apricot peach mead. And we put this in the barrel in the end of September last year. So this is 11 months in the barrel and I've never tried this. So this is gonna be fun. So as always, when pulling a nail, we've gotta sanitize. So we've got our isopropyl here and we're gonna hit the bung with some isopropyl in case we need to introduce a little bit of fresh pressure to push some, some of that meat out of the, the sample hole. When you're uh, taking a sample from a barrel, you can you know, clean the bung ideally, remove that, put a wine thief in, but you're potentially introducing wild yeast bacteria or something in the air, even like these, you know, there's a couple of fruit flies, like they're everywhere, right? But we do a good job of keeping them down, but you don't want those guys to fall in there. And so if you're able to pull a sample just from this nail hole, you're, you're potentially reducing some of the risks that could negatively impact what's inside the barrel. So I'm talking right now because I'm letting this alcohol dry because if I take my glass and, and, and even, even if I don't touch the wood, you could have a little bit of that isopropyl get in and I don't want to disturb the sample. So this barrel is also pretty interesting because it's oxidizing, like the wood itself is turning gray and that's kind of wild. And it's interesting to think about how oxygen and oxidation affects, it affects our bodies in, in some, some negative ways potentially and then it can, it can affect your mead, your wine, your beer in positive and negative ways. So if you ever leave a, a bottle of wine, you know, open for whatever reason for a couple days on your counter, and you go back to try and it tastes a little stale, a little cardboardy, that's rapid oxidation. And that's not a flavor that, that you want, but micro oxidation is beautiful. And that will create the flavors that you get from like port, cherry, Madeira. And it's something that you wanna, you, you wanna have when something's been in a barrel for a while. So. This is dry enough now to pull a sample. So we've got our superstition glass ready to catch. So we've used a 764 inch drill bit to place this hole just the right size for a 4D nail. And we're getting this sample coming out that I can already tell there's an impact from the staves on the color of Harris Orchard. So Typically, this is this bright gold, and there's this beautiful, just rose hue that's happening from this liquid going in and out of the grain of the wood. All right, we'll let that ISO settle down from the air for a minute as well, so I can get a really nice take on the aroma. So whenever you, oh, look at that. That is gorgeous. Whenever you uh, are trying something for the first time in a glass, you go to a restaurant, you order new wine, mead, cider, whatever, give it a swirl. You're introducing oxygen. So we're talking about oxygen and oxidation. 
you're not going to have that rapid staling oxidation by doing this, but what it's going to do is allow the air that's just around us to mix with the liquid, and it will help the aromas that are in here express themselves. And if you were to, to warm your glass by holding it, with two hands, that'll happen even faster. And so that's why wine glasses have stems. I always like to think about that. You know, I mean, you can get stemless glassware and those are cool and hip, but I always like to kind of just swirl by the stem, evaluate what you're looking at. I'm looking at the, the legs of this, this really, oh, there's some legs. They're up high, because I was swirling like crazy. There they are. So that's indicative of something that has a lot of body and alcohol when you see those beautiful legs coming down the side of the glass. It smells like crazy ripe apricots. So we call this Harris Orchard because we have references to history, religion, mythology, and a lot of our product names. And the 11th labor of Hercules in Greek mythology was to steal golden apples from Harris Orchard. And today, Historians actually think that they were referring to, not to golden apples, but to apricots. So that's some cool mythology trivia for your next dinner party. Let's see how this is gonna, gonna t oh man. That is really, really expressive. All right, let's see how it's tasting. That's outstanding. If you've ever had dried apricots and that and that flavor is like so concentrated, I'm getting that out of this. And it's kind of going back and forth between the peach and the apricot, which are similar complementary stone fruit flavors. But the apricot's really dominating this for me. If I use my imagination, I can taste blackberry, but I wouldn't quite go that far if I was writing a label description on this, but there is the presence of another fruit flavor, a berryness in general, and a hint of vanilla, which is coming both from what was once aging in this that had vanilla and from the wood. It's also possessing this umami savoriness that just keeps kicking all the way. I mean, you can smell it. And then as, as the liquid gets the attack or the beginning of your palate, that, that just the very first sensation of, of a flavor that you get when you take a sip of something, that's the attack, right? It's umami. And it just goes across the mid palate and right into the finish. And I've been you know, speaking for about 20, 30 seconds since I took that last sip and I can still taste this. It's just coating like the sides of my tongue. I feel it on the back of my teeth in such a cool way. There's a pleasant astringency, not in an all flavor way at all, but in a balancing way, a counterbalance to the sweetness. This is sweet, by the way. And when something is sweet, it often allows the flavors that you're trying to showcase real, to really shine. I'm thinking about and, and this is not like a Sauterne in the flavor profile, but I'm thinking about like a Chateau de Chem Sauterne. I had a, an amazing dinner with some friends from Bottle Logic. We were in Copenhagen a couple years ago, and we got to try like the best Sauterne in the world. And that's this very sweet French white wine, and it's delicious. It's like, you know, it's the pinnacle. It's what you would compare something to, I guess, if you're thinking about asking yourself, how good is this? And this has even more flavor than that. So, I don't know, this is just awesome. And when it comes to something that you would have with, I mean, I know you could pair this with a lot of things, but I'm always thinking of that like, if, if you're into cigars and you wanna have something to counterbalance like a really awesome cigar, this would be perfect to pair with a cigar. If you were eating something that was maybe had a, a bit of acid or fat, either one. This could be a complementary or contrasting pairing. It would also complement something really savory like five spice, you know, Asian style barbecue ribs. 
and just by itself, this is perfect. Wow, and it's so cool how I love Harris Orchard, our seasonal release that comes out, but when you put it into a barrel, it just, it gets elevated. I mean, that's why we're doing this. Literally, we're elevating barrels, but the barrels are elevating our products. And again, as far as a never been done before novel sort of thing, this is the third batch of barrel aged Harris, but we've never put it into this barrel and, and never will again. When you get a bottle of this or, or whenever we release this, come in and order a glass or whatever and press, get Phoenix or whoever else may happen to get some of these bottles, you're, you're going to be able to enjoy something that has never been made before and never will be made again. There's absolutely no way we're going to get the exact ratio of the liquids and the times they spent in this. It just won't happen again. We'll do barrel aged hairs again and it'll be a little bit different and it'll be fun to compare them. But this is a one off. I mean, this is a one of a kind will never happen again situation. And it's so fun to, to be trying this for the first time. And we put this in a barrel 11 months ago and it's just done some, some wonders here. Wow. Cheers.